Has anybody in here this morning ever asked yourself this question about what does a name really mean? Has anybody in here besides me ever done that? Now, has anybody ever like actually searched for different people's names? You might have searched for your own. Kelly, I'm not the only weirdo that does that, okay? So I don't feel so bad. Now, the other day I decided to look at some different names and figure out what do these names mean. And so the first one I have is Marcus. This one has a great meaning for it. It means hammer. Like that is such a manly name. I'm Marcus and I drop the hammer on everybody I meet. Like strong, powerful name. Then I, look up, I looked up Natalia. It means born on Christmas. That's amazing where every Christmas it's Christmas presents and your birthday all at the same time. Natalia, born on Christmas. I wish that was my name, but I'm not a girl. So... We'll leave it at that. Carlos means a free man. Free man. I would like to have that in everything in my life. Here's the next one, Brendan. I know a couple people named Brendan, and that name means prince, a royal name. Wish that was my name. Then we have Sean. Sean, listen to this, means God's gracious gift. It's a beautiful name, a beautiful meaning. Then we have Joshua, which is the Lord is my salvation. And Margaret, this is for you. I looked up Margaret's name. Her name means pearl. She's a treasure, ladies and gentlemen. So if your name is Margaret, guess what? You're a pearl. You're a prized possession. Then I decided to look up my sister. Her name is Christy, and I look up her name, and it means Christian, which, okay, I can see how that's related. I looked up my brother's name, whose name is Curtis, and his means refined, accomplished, and courteous. Then I looked up my beautiful wife Kelly's name, and her name means warrior, bright-minded, which is why I sleep with one eye open, (laughs) because at any moment I could get attacked. So at this point in my list, I was super stoked to look up my name. I was like, oh, yeah, I got to have some amazing manly royalty name. I look it up. I type in my name in the search box. I hit enter, and it pops up. The origin and meaning of Brad is a broad meadow. (laughs) Really? Not warrior, not brave, courage, a broad... I don't even understand what that means. Does that mean I'm grass? Does that mean sheep and deer run on me and graze on me? I'm not sure what the meaning of my name here is. And why couldn't I get a cool one? Well, I sat back and I thought about it. I know my mom and dad have, did not choose my name based upon what it meant. They chose it based upon that they liked the sound of it. It fit with my middle name and my last name and they they gave it to me. But I also know that there are parents who chose names for their children based upon the meaning of that name, and they said, I really like this name and what it stands for, so I'm going to give it to my child. And so at this point, you might be thinking, what does this have anything to do with about, with about God's word this morning? And so you see, there is something that we have to understand. Before we jump into today's text, we've got to understand the ancient world mindset. And in the ancient Near East, where the Bible was written and who was written to the audience there, they had a very particular and important emphasis that they put on names. Names were not just given haphazardly. Names were not just given without any purpose. They were extremely important. When a name was given to a person, or whether they gave it to some false god, that name gave immediately the character, the personality, the mission, and the purpose of that human or God. It determined that person's character. And when you heard of God's name, when it comes out and says, I'm I'm the son God, that means his purpose and mission was about the son. Names were extremely important in ancient Near East. And I know for most of us, when we meet somebody new, I've met a lot of new people, and not once did I ever meet somebody and say, hey, my name is Charles, and I went, hold on one second. Siri, what does Charles mean? We don't look up people's names. 
What we do today is how we know a person's character, purpose, essence, and nature is we base that off of the life lived. Do we not? And so in our modern world, we not, some of us might know what different names mean, but we look at who the person actually is. What, how they truly live reveals to us their character and their very true nature. And so what I mean by that is I'm going to have something fun for the kids. And so this will be something that I want the kids to engage in. Now, I know there's some wives that say my husband is a kid. Yes, he can participate if he wants to, okay? So anybody is more than welcome. But for the kids, I'm going to give you something very simple. I'm going to show you an image, a picture, and you got to tell me if it's good or if this person is bad. Is it a good person or a bad person? You got it? All right, here's the first one. Super Mario. Super Mario is good. Okay, you guys got that. Put up the next one, the Joker. Yes, he's bad. He's a naughty guy. Then we put up Magneto. This one might be a little tough. He's a bad guy, okay? Now let's put up this guy, real life person, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Good, very good, right? Now let's put up the next one, Kevin Durant. All depends on who you like. So, since he's the champion, he's good, okay? So, um, I'll put up the next one. Here's the next one. Judas Iscariot who betrayed Jesus. Bad. You guys are getting it. You guys are smart. Last one is Jesus. Good, okay? You see, even today, names mean something to us because name describes a person's character, purpose, mission, and essence and their very nature. And so it was extremely important back then. It's still extremely important today. And when you, a few weeks ago, we looked at Exodus chapter 3, where Moses meets God in the burning bush. And as Moses is talking to God, God's telling him, I need you to go to the people of Israel. I'm going to use you to lead them out of Egypt, and I'm going to set you free to your own land. And one of the questions that Moses asked God is he said, well, what is your name? In other words, Moses is asking that question because he wants to know. In that time, they believed in a lot of false gods everywhere. And he wanted to know, okay, you're God. What's your purpose? Who are you? What are you about? What, do I, what are you calling me to be about? And God tells him, I am who I am. And I know all of us are sitting back going, that's very confusing. It's wordy. There's a late... Uh, college professor, his name was John Silheimer, he says this way, when God says, I am who I am, a way that it can be translated is this, it is God who is present or he who has promised to be present with his people. I'll read it again. It is he who is present or he who has promised to be present with his people. You see, our God was about one thing entering into a relationship with his people, with you. You see, one thing that you may not know about the ancient Near East is the gods in the ancient Near East had one purpose, interacting with mankind. That was so man could meet the needs of the God. And God tells Moses, I'm the God who is going to be present with you and with your people and with everyone who comes after you. Our God has come, not just as our creator. He doesn't come so, he doesn't build a relationship with us so we can meet his needs and do things for him. God is establishing a relationship with you so that he can meet your needs. You with me this morning? You see, that's why Moses wanted to find out, who are you, God? And this morning, we're going to see something very important about the use of God's name. We're in Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. And so if you have your Bible, we're going to look at just this verse and this passage. We've been going through the Ten Commandments. And this is one that we have heard probably 111 times. And we've probably heard a lot of messages about this. But here's what God's word says. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. 
God immediately tells us that he does not want us to take his name in vain. And the very first question we have to ask is, well, what does it mean to take his name in vain? What does the word vain even mean? The word vain means this, to use it for an empty purpose. Or to kind of clarify it a little better, it's to use it for no good purpose. And if we combine all that together, we misuse God's name when we use it for an empty, no good purpose. That's taking the Lord's name in vain. And God takes it super seriously. He says at the end of the verse, the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Now, you might sit back and, well, what's that punishment, Brad? What does that look like? How does God mediate that judgment? And I don't know. But I do know that God says in his words that God disciplines those whom he loves. And when we misuse his name, yeah, he disciplines us. But the discipline, the punishment is not the point this morning. What the point of this is, is God's not saying, I want you to focus on judgment. So many times as human beings, we want to focus on the judgment. And yeah, anytime somebody misuses God's name, punishment's coming. That's not the point. What God desires from us is to make sure that we understand what it means to use his name to bring him honor and glory, to use his name so our relationship with God grows greater, grows stronger, and grows more loving. The point is not the discipline. The discipline is there to tell us, look, if we misuse it, there's a consequence. Are you with me? Okay. So we're going to take a closer look at this. Uh, The first thing I put on my notes is this. How do we misuse God's name? So it says don't misuse it. Don't use it for an empty, good, no good purpose. So what are the ways that we misuse it? The first one, I labeled it this way. I titled it casual conversation. This is the things where you see where nowadays you have people that text so much. It's the OMG, good God, Lord have mercy, Jesus Christ. It's the casual conversation where we are not calling upon God's name for a good purpose. We're saying it flippantly in our conversations. And this is the way that we've heard this passage taught so many times is don't use it as profanity. Don't take his name in vain. Don't use his holy name flippantly. And all of us in our natural, sinful nature We have the natural tendency to misuse his name flippantly all the time. Each of us at some point in time have used his, misused his name in this way. But Jesus challenges us when he gives the Sermon on the Mount. He said, when you guys are talking to God, when you mention his name, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And so, so many times we misuse God's name because we flippantly say it. Whether something bad happens and we immediately comes out and we profane that name because we're not using it in that moment to call upon him, to seek him, to search him. You see, the next thing that I put is this, oaths. We misuse God's name in oaths. Well, how's that? Well, in the ancient Near East, this is what it really referred to and I'll tell you how it applies for today. In the ancient Near East, they would have a judicial trial. Some two parties would be in court trying to say, this happened, no, this happened, no, this happened, and you're guilty, no, you're guilty. If anybody stood up at any point in time and said, I swear to God that my version of the events are true, the judge would immediately award that person the trial. Case closed. Now, selfish, sinful people, if we knew that all we had to do was swear by God, and you're sitting in a court, you better be the first one to declare it, right? And so you're going to have people that naturally abuse a good system. And they come out and they were swearing falsely under oath by calling upon God's name saying, God's going to validate my falsehood. And this is what God is warning us against. Now, I know a lot of you in here are not sitting on trial, and you're not sitting there like, okay, how does this apply to me, Brad? Well, Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, but I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. In other words, Jesus is saying, we do not use the king to get what we want. 
God is king, and his name should be revered and respected and not used to validate our falsehood. Now, how do we do that today? Because a lot of us aren't sitting in a court. But I will say this is how we do it today. There are things that we say where I swear to God I'm telling you the truth even though we're not. I'll give you some examples. Looks like this. I swear to God I'm not looking at adult websites, even though I do. I swear to God I'm trying my best to make this marriage work, yet I'm doing nothing to make it work. I swear to God I'm hanging out at my friend's house, Mom, but I'm really at a party. I swear to God I did all my homework, even though I haven't done it in a week. I swear to God I clean my room, even though I've just been playing video games. I swear to God I'm not using drugs, even though I use them regularly. I swear to God I'm not talking bad about you, even though I am. Get the idea? See, we misuse God's name when we invoke his name to validate our lies. And I'm sure it, all of us at some point, I know I've done things like this. Say, man, I'm t- yeah, but God, I'm telling you, I swear to God, I'm, I'm doing the right thing. And I wasn't. We misuse God's name when we do that. Jesus tells us, <laughs> he says, would you please just let what you say be simply yes or no? Because anything more that comes from this is from evil. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't live a life of falsehood. Walk in truth. Now you might sit back and say, well, isn't there a proper time to swear by God's name? Yeah, there is. Isaiah 45, 23 says it this way. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return, To me, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. You see, we can swear by God's name when he receives glory and honor and praise that he rightfully deserves. So there's a right way to to swear by his name. But we have to understand that there's so many times we misuse it and abuse it when we swear by his name to validate our falsehoods. Here's the next thing I put. We misuse his name for personal gain. What do I mean by that? Well, very simply, we use his name to get something we want. And you might sit back and you're like, I'm gonna give you a few examples. You might say, Brad, you're being a little hard here, but I'm just telling you things that I've done in my life. I'm right here with you, okay? (laughs) As I was working on this all week long and talking to my wife, we were talking, we're like, man, like, this is a constant daily reminder for us as it is for everyone in here this morning. And and we do it in all kinds of ways because we want God to do what we want, not what he wants. Amen? We do this all the time. We say we want what God wants, but then when God doesn't give us what we want, all of a sudden we struggle with what God has given to us. We're like, well, God hasn't brought me this. Well, that, maybe God doesn't want you to have that. And then we get mad, and here's what we do. I'm going to focus on God right now so that guy or girl over there will like me. So I'm just going to get my life right first because then that girl or guy over there. Personal gain. Using God to get something you want, not what he wants. Well, you know what? I'm going to speak God's name so he can fix my finances. So I'm coming to God, and you're going to fix my bank account, and you're going to make it all better. Are you going to God for God or for your personal gain? I'm going to speak God's name so he gives me a child. You seeking God or are you seeking a child? I'm going to use God's name so I can get rid of an addiction. I'm going to use God's name so I can get a cell phone, a big screen TV, a a new car. And if I just focus on God, God's going to bless me with that thing I'm looking for. Or I'm going to use God's name 
kids so I can get a video game. You see, we are no different than the people in the ancient Near East. They misuse their God's names all the time. We misuse it. See, here's the thing. God is not about giving us our selfish desires. When we speak God's name, when we seek God's name, when we search and we say God and we focus on living for God, the point is not getting. The point is on knowing God and being known by him. But so many times we misuse and profane his name because we want God to do something that we want for our lives. And not just really realizing that the prize of all of this is your relationship with Jesus Christ. Everything else fades in the distance. Like I know my wife thinks I'm the most handsome man on the planet. But sooner or later, I'm going to turn super wrinkly and I'm no longer going to have that pizzazz. But the one thing she will always have that will never fade, that will never grow weary, that will never turn ugly, that will never, never ever stop being beautiful is her Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we use God's name to seek and to know the prize, which is God himself, not what God could do for us with these personal things that we think we need in life. Are you with me? See, there are people during this time that they would take a God's name and they realize that I can make money off of this God's name. I can sell things, make money, just put God, that God's name on it and I'll do it. You guys see that happening in the Christian church today? Better believe it. There are people in ministry only to make money. They do it just to make it. There's people that they do it to gain a following. And their whole effort is to go out and to use God's name so they got a bunch of people. I have 70,000 people liking my pictures on Instagram. They're using God's name in vain. We have others that use it to become popular, to become famous, to use it as the next wave of I can be the next so-and-so person in the Christian world. And God is looking for people that say, hey, you know what, I'm going to use your name so that I could just be known by you and to know you and to let others know about you. You with me? So we must remember that when we seek God's name, we are praying that God's will is to be done on earth as it is in heaven, not our will. We must come to God not for, what he, for who he is, not for what he could give us. We must make sure that he receives all the honor and the glory he deserves. Here's the next thing I put in my notes. I said, the next way we misuse it is through untruths. Now you might say that's kind of a weird word, Brad, untruths. What do I mean by that? What I mean by this, we misuse God's name when we say things about God that take away from his character, his essence, his purpose, and his very being. Things like you've heard somebody say, God is a liar. That is an untruth. God is just an angry God sitting up there with a big long beard and anytime anybody sins, he's zapping them with lightning. That is a untruth about our God. Some people say there is no God. That's an untruth. All religions lead to God. That's an untruth. If you truly love me, you will do this immoral act with me. That is an untruth that God does not say in his word. The more money I give to the church, the richer God will make me. That is an untruth. That's not what God says. God gave the desire to lust, therefore I have the right to an affair. That is an untruth. That is not what God says. God cannot love a sinner like me. That's an untruth. That's not what God says. God does not care what happens to us. That is an untruth. That is not not what God says. God is not doing anything about the evil in the world or my world. That is an untruth. God does not say that. Everything we speak about God must speak his truth, must speak his wisdom, and any delineation from that is speaking an untruth and misusing his name. Because catch this, when we talk about God, we are his representatives in the world to reconcile the world back to him. If we speak an untruth, we're telling people to believe in a false God and souls are at stake. 
So it's important for us to know what this book says about our holy and just God and loving God and perfect God and God who loves everyone deeply. It's important for us to know it. Because if we misuse it, God says he will not hold us guiltless. He will discipline us for misusing his name. And so we need to make sure if we're not spending time in God's word, spend it. Make a commitment and say, God, I want to know you. I want to know your truth so I can communicate it to others. You see, these untruths do not portray his beauty, his glory, and his splendor to a lost and dying world. Now, I know that there are so many other ways that we can misuse God's name. I don't have the time to exhaust all of those ways because we'd be here for a very long time. But these are the ones that I sit back and I think that I see the most common ways that we misuse. And if God has brought something to your mind of another way we misuse God, then thank God that he brought that to your mind for you not to misuse his name in that way. But there are many others that we could sit back and say, and the important part is this, is we have to make sure that the name that we are representing and bringing into the world represents who God really is. Here's the second thing I put in my notes. How do we properly use God's name? First way is this, I said worship. We looked at how we misuse God's name. Now let's look at, because God wants us to properly use his name. The first way we use it is in worship. God desires us to use his name. And when we worship him, we focus on his attributes. We focus on his character. We focus on his nature. We sing songs today. You're our healer. My heart is yours. Give it all. I give it all to you, God. And later we're going to sing another amazing song, which we'll get to later this, this, this afternoon. But here's the point. Worshiping God through songs is what God desires from us. Ephesians 5, 18 and 19 says this, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Now catch this, it doesn't end with the period. There's a flow of thought still going. Be filled with the Spirit. How's that? How are we filled with the Spirit? This is how. Catch it. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual what? Songs doing what? singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Catch this. God has designed worship through song to fill us with the Spirit. So many times we think to be filled with the Spirit is I need to do this new devotional. Which is fine, that's good. I need to read this new Christian book. That's going to make me feel. Look, he's telling you, Paul is saying, look. One spiritual weapon that God has given us to attack Satan and temptation is worship songs. And God will give you the victory over sin and temptation when you worship him through song. Sometimes we look at songs and singing songs as trivial. No, this is where there's power. This is where you're filled with the Spirit. This is where you're declaring how great our God is. Because when you're singing worship songs, who are you thinking about? You're thinking about God. And God's Spirit is filling you up, encouraging you, and giving you that strength to go out and live today with all the bad that's in this world. And then tomorrow you wake up and you sing and you make a melody. And notice it says, sing with other people. Because there might be times you won't feel like singing. But those people will say, hey, we got to sing because our God is great. Our God is holy. Our God is good. Our God is loving. Our God loves you despite your sin. We worship God through songs. The other way we worship him is by declaring his great works. This is a great passage from 1 Chronicles 16, uh, 23 through 31. Check this out. It says, sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And he is to be held in awe above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made 
the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. Ascribe to the Lord, O clans of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. And let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. We worship him and use his name properly when we declare the great works he's done for us. But not only that, we worship his great name by, as Paul says, presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our spiritual worship. It's the idea behind this. A lot of words to say this. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So as you live your life loving God, knowing God, and people begin to see that, you help them to know and to love God who is in heaven. Here's the next thing I put, how we use his name properly, is through teaching. All of us bear the responsibility to teach. It's not just pastors, it's not just ministry leaders, it's everybody, no matter where you are. It's a parent, it's a grandparent, it's a friend, it's a coworker, wherever you find you, yourself, God has given each of us the responsibility to tell us. And teaching doesn't mean you got to put everybody in a room and sit down and give them workbooks. And you, It's just you telling people about God, telling them things about this great God that they may not have ever known before. Or sharing a struggle where you went through a trial and you put your hope in God and how God walked you through that difficult journey. That is teaching people. Jesus said it this way to his disciples, which includes us in here this morning that claim Christ as Savior. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And what's that word? Teaching them to, ob to ob observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Paul, so Paul says it this way in Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. We use God's name properly when we tell others about this great God. And here's the, the last way, through prayer. Properly use his name in prayer. See, when we go to God in prayer and use his name, we are recognizing him as our provider, as our deliverer, our king, our victory over temptation. When we use his name in prayer, we realize, God, you're in control, not me. God, you are the one that can do a work of of change in my heart, not myself. Psalm 25, 1, I love it. It says very simply, to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. To you, O Lord, no one else, nothing else, to God alone. Psalm 62, 8 says it this way, trust in him at all times, good, bad, ugly, whatever it is, Trust in him at all times, O oh people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Prayer is a proper way to use God's name. Jesus said it this way, right? His disciples said, Jesus, what does it mean to pray? How do we pray? And he looks at him and says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We properly use his name through worship, teaching, and prayer. And I'm going to end with this and we'll be done in just a minute. Why is his name so important? Why is his name so important? His name's so important it's because he's our creator. He's the only true God in the universe. As his creation, God has made each of us, made you in his image. And being made in his image is we reflect God's character and nature in his world so that the world would reflect praise and glory back to God. But if you're like me this morning, 
Has anybody in here reflected that image correctly, perfectly, your whole entire life? No. As God's image bearers, we have failed. We have so many times we've given the world a marred view and image of God on our life. And so this morning I tell you, I have wrestled with these things. Man, I got to pray and I got to worship so that I don't misuse God's name at all. Because there's nobody in this room that can say, I have properly used God's name my whole entire life. There's no one in here, no one in the world. But we do know there's one person who used God's name properly, who worshiped God's name perfectly, who taught God's word and name perfectly. And it is a beautiful name itself. His name is Jesus. You see, I think we so easily misuse God's name because we easily forget what a beautiful name it is. You might say, well, Brad, how do we, how do we forget that it's a beautiful name? How could we ever forget? Well, here's how it is. This is how it works out in my life. We forget his beautiful name when the stresses of life rear its ugly head into our life. Nuclear bomb goes off in your life, that's a huge stress. We forget all the good that God has ever done. And instead of focusing on the great and mighty, we focus on our ugly problem. And that's when we begin to misuse God's name. And so I just want to take a moment. Have you ever sat down and meditated on what a beautiful name it is? And so I kind of, I went through scripture as I was preparing this, and I just want to take a few moments for us to remember this God, these truths about this God. And I just want to share this with you, and I hope it will bless you as it blessed me. When we speak about this beautiful name, he is the ancient of days and the almighty. He is the beginning and the end. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He is our creator and our sustainer. He is our judge and our peacemaker. He is our father and our provider. He is our great physician and our healer. He is our deliverer and our savior. He is our vindicator and our champion. He is our rock and our refuge. He is our salvation and our joy. He is our justifier and our glorifier. He is our rest and our safety. He is our shepherd and our God. He is our God who hears and our God who answers. He is our God who sees and our God who acts. He is our source of knowledge and our source of wisdom. He is our truth and our life. He is our manna and our bread of life. He is our bridegroom and we are his bride. He is our comforter and our counselor. He is our door and our way. He is our king eternal and our king of glory. He is our living God and our living water. He is excellent and majestic. He is faithful and true. He is the son of David and the son of God. He is the high priest and the head of the church. He is the only begotten son and he is the Passover lamb. He is the true light and the true witness. He is the vine and he is the potter. He is the rose of Sharon and the righteous one. He is the name above all names and he is Christ our Lord. He has no rivals. He has no equal. What a beautiful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. I want you to bow your hearts with me this morning because we'll close. There are so many more descriptions about God in Scripture that I did not even touch. And when we understand who this God is, that his, his goal is catch this, he wants to enter into a relationship with each of us this morning. Those of us have already entered into that relationship. But God's one desire is for you to be known by him and to reflect his image to a lost world so that they would in turn be known by God. And so many times we forget how great God is and all the great works he's done for us. And we focus on our stresses in life, which lead us to misuse God's name and take it in vain. But here's the encouraging part, guys. God knew each of us were going to misuse his name. 
and he sent his one and only son to die on the cross for us. And everyone who confesses faith in Jesus Christ becomes a child of God. And so you might be in the place where you're like, man, I've misused God's name a lot. Don't fret. The Bible says God is our father. And just like a father will discipline their child, it doesn't mean that that child is no longer loved. It doesn't mean that child is no longer a part of the family. The father just wants to teach the child, hey, to be a part of this family. This is what it means. This is what I expect. This is what God's telling us this morning. To be a part of my family. For you to worship me. Don't misuse my name. When you speak it, speak it out of reverence. Speak it out of respect. And give that name all the honor and glory that is due.